So it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to talk, uh, speak a little bit about almost genomics philosophy at the beginning, get to some chemistry as to how chemistry can help study human biology, and then finally with uh, an idea of how we can start to uh, consider drug discovery as a public good endeavor instead of a commercially driven endeavor. And so I love this uh, statement of we professors always, you know, publishing in our one-word journals and thinking we're so good. Well, you know, we're not doing so well. Every year around the world we spend about a quarter of a trillion dollars in biomedical research. And for most diseases, we have no clue uh, what causes them. Parkinson lived in 1808. Uh, we still don't know. Ask a neurologist what causes Parkinson's. We'll spout out some genes and some dopamine, and then, they, that, then that's it. And so if you don't know what causes it, it's very hard to cure it, and we've not done well. And then when we do make medicines, they're not affordable for most people on the planet. So no one in their right mind would think, by God, we're doing well. Right? And so the, the question is, how do we do better, and how do we do better faster? Because right? eventually this has all be done, but it's a matter of doing it more quickly. And so well, in one aspect, you think, well, the commercial part of this is, is using capital efficiency and doing well. But that's not true, because this graph here is the uh, number of drugs you get per billion dollars invested. And this is over decades in time scale. And there's just recent reports that it's going to go to zero soon. And so the idea that um, industry, you know, if academia is not doing so well, industry at least is efficient and, you know, make decisions and milestones and Gantt charts and everything's so good. Well, no, it's not true. And so we have a real fundamental problem in how we understand biology and how we translate that knowledge. And in part, genomics is going to help, in part, and I'm going to explain to you, maybe not. And so. Um, let's look at a mirror at the academics in the audience and how we behave and how we have been conf tackling the problem of our lack of knowledge of human biology. And the Genome Project, which of course a third of which was done here, was supposed to be transformative and, and change the way we do science. And I think the evidence suggests it's not like that. And to do that, what we did was we did a bibliometric analysis of return, research intensity. And the genome among other wonderful things about it, it's really the only area of any kind of scientific endeavor where you can draw a box around. A chemist can make an infinite more compounds. There's an infinite number of stars. How do you quantify research activity on that infinity, as it were? But the genome, right, every gene has a name, and you can actually count how many papers there are per gene, look at that through time, by jurisdiction, and gain a lot of knowledge about how we allocate our intellectual resources, right? And remember, we don't understand rheumatoid arthritis, ALS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. We, we don't understand biology, and the genome was supposed to give us the, the path to do so. So in this graph, we just took the kinases as a subset of, of genes in the human genome. There's 518. And last millennium, as it were, most of the research activity was on a subset because most of these hadn't been cloned yet, so we didn't even know they existed, right? So this makes a lot of sense. And of course, some were popular and some not. And if what we had said was true, that this would change the way we do science, we would expect in the subsequent years there'd be a load of discovery down here as we appreciate at that time. We didn't know what the diseases were called. So if you look at the same pattern in uh, today, um, you can see that this is, so what you do is just take kinase papers published in 2016, where are we publishing? and you just look for the name of the kinase in the title, abstract, or keywords, you can see that most of the research activity, indeed 70 percent or so, are on the same kinases that we were studying last century, okay? And everybody who's written a grant knows why this happens, and that's courtesy of Sanger, that's BRAF, right? So when it gets hot, it really gets hot. Um, but the idea is, you know, you can't write a grant on something. Now, I want to study kinase 430, no one knows what it does, I want to find out what it does. That'll go in the bin, wherever the bin is, right? It's non-hypothesis driven. Where's your elegant hypothesis? The people around the table don't work on kinase 450, so if they think it's a dumb idea, you want to get funded, you want to get tenure, you want to get invited to Cambridge and give talks, work up here, right? Because everyone thinks you're brilliant because you work on what they do. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a really serious indictment on us as academics, right? We, we, every time we go to a grant panel, they say, fund the innovative stuff. We can't help ourselves. 
Now, it's not this stuff, it's not, it's not as if it's not interesting. Of course it's interesting science. But if you take a step back, are we deploying our resources correctly as a society? I would argue no. And it gets worse. And so I've said this before, if anyone's heard this talk, is that the, the, the hypothesis I had was that Canadians are smarter than everyone else. And therefore, we would be different. So all you need to go is 2016 Kinase plus Canada and just extract only the subset of these papers that are published by Canadians. Okay? Now if you did this by Welcome Funded, if you did this by Harvard, it all looks the same. And it makes sense, right? Academics read the same literature. No one's really smarter than anybody else. There's a formula to writing grants. There's a formula to reviewing grants. There's no reason to expect different outcomes. So we take that, let's say, $120, $140 million, billion dollars spelt in, spent in the public, divide it parochially among countries, and Brex and UK is the epitome of parochial now, um, and what you're going to find is you're going to get the same research funded everywhere. So if you eliminated Canada from the globe now, it would make not a bit of difference to science at all. Every experiment we're doing is in some respect being done somewhere else. Right? And so again, if we're trying to think of how to have an impact, because I think that's what Open Targets wants to have as an impact, we have to confront this. We have to confront the fact that you know, we are not really behaving appropriately. And in large part, it's because how we review grants and we fund grants by nation, not by science. It has an impact on drug discovery. So if you take these, so these are genetic experiments to show that there's cool kinases everywhere. So this is where we work. And industry, remember these were popular in the late 90s, 10 years later industry is still patenting there, right? And, and that's as a result of the same reasons. Industry can't take flyers on a kinase nobody heard of. They need to have literature. If we provide the literature here, that's where they're going to work. Leaving a whole swath of life untouched. And the consequences of this for drug discovery, we don't understand biology. Every drug discovery experiment is a dart being thrown. And what happens is that if you look at the process of at least small molecule drug discovery, you got your target, you know, validation in quotation marks. It's relatively simple for many to make a molecule that can inhibit it or modulate it. It's relatively simple now to pharmacologically improve it, that it has drug-like properties and to avoid toxicology. You get some attrition along the way, right? We're relatively good at getting into, and then when we finally test it for the first time at this stage of the process, seven years later, we say, does it work in a human being? Most of the time it doesn't. And so all we brilliant people up here, certain that this is a valid target, the evidence shows it's not. And the evidence shows it, I would argue, because we don't have a clue about biology. If you look at the, the previous slides, most of the genes in us, we don't really have a function for apart from, you know, it looks like a kinase, okay? So this is the big problem when the SGC started, right? This was true then, it is true now. How does one make the research, as it were, enterprise move to areas of science where they don't really want to work? And this is, is when we talk about target validation, it's silly for any of us to speak about it because the evidence shows we get it wrong most of the time. The only time you know that inhibiting or modulating that protein or, or lipid or, or nucleic acid has a positive effect on patients is when you test them in patients. So they're only validated in people. So genetics, it doesn't validate targets. Chemical probes, chemistry, what we do, doesn't validate targets. Big data will not validate targets. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, yeah? We don't know anything, so if we get a lot of big data about nothing, no, then we're not gonna know anymore. Uh, the latest whiz-bang technology won't validate targets, right? Currently, in the state of the universe now, where we have so much unknown, none of these ideas have worked. And every, I've been at this now for 30 years. Every year, there's the technology of the day. Now it's the, and then, blah, blah, blah. And then it's something else. It's high throughput screening. It's, it's, it's CRISPR. It's AI. Blah, blah. It ain't going to work. So what can we do? Well, the first thing we do, we've got to figure out the sociology of us. How do we get us to deploy more of our intellectual resources in areas where nobody works before? The system won't allow us, so somehow we gotta figure that out. And we have a, you know, a very relatively, by global standards, a small group, so how, how, how can we do it? And we've discovered by the evidence, 
I'm going to make the argument that it's research tools that are the key to moving people, not genetics, not uh, an idea. And so if you have a look at the uncomfortable truth, this is made by a colleague in Berger Ingelheim, where they looked at all the genes. As, I mean, it's very rough, and if you look in the details, it's probably wrong. But if you look at OMIM and GWAS, you'll find out that there are interesting genetics all over, but most of the scientific community works on what we worked on before for historical. Um, and so, and that continues to the day. So the idea that a, a cool genetic story will make everyone stop doing what they're doing and shift and work on it is not really borne out by the evidence. So these are the solute carrier channel family, there's about 400 in the human genome. We sort of parse them in, in the hot ones, right, in the, by citations. And although there's a little bit of a, you know, a, a shift to disease genes in the highly cited ones, there's disease genes all the way through. And these are strongly linked. This is not just associated. These are actually mutated, okay? And so the idea that you have a strong genetic driver of a disease and that will cause people to work on it is not borne out by the evidence. What is borne out by the evidence, though, is the availability of research tools. And for this, it's a, a retrospective a narrative. But if you look at the nuclear hormone receptor family in humans, there are 48 of them. They bind small molecule ligands as a part of their normal function. Estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, androgen receptor. And the proteins, of course, they're called receptors, but they don't sit at the cell surface. They're intracellular uh, proteins. They sort of have two parts in general, a DNA binding part that brings the protein to near a gene, and then the receptor part, which when it binds its ligand, let's say estrogen, changes its structure, recruits transcription factors, and starts gene expression. Okay, so they're transcription factors that happen to bind small molecule ligands. And so if you look at them, let's look at the pattern of research in the nuclear receptor field. So this is the current order of, um, you know, popular on the popularometer. There are a bunch of them that garner most of the papers, some that have none. There's genetic targets all the way down there, but they're not really worked on. And let's, and this had an interesting trajectory, and GlaxoSmithKline played a huge role in the opening up of this family. Uh, in the mid-90s, these were cloned by the biotech companies that were cloning disease-related genes, and they licensed the genetic information to a few pharmaceutical companies. And the pharmaceutical companies know one of these is a drug target, so estrogen receptor, maybe there are others out there. But we don't know what these things do, nobody works on them. Our hammer is chemistry, so why don't we do a little thought experiment why don't we find a compound that inhibits the protein that we don't know what it does and use the compound and squirt it on cells and animals and stuff and try and find out the function of the protein through the chemistry, okay? Reverse endocrinology, they called it at the time. And so GlaxoSmithKline spent the 90s doing this, setting up cell-based assays in which they would have a DNA binding domain and then they would uh, make a chimera protein with the various ligands and use gene expression assays. They'd screen their libraries, they'd optimize the compounds, they'd make really selective compounds. And then they thought, crap, now we don't know what to do. And so they started to form collaborations with one-off professors, but that was so slow. And then the, the a really important step is said, why don't we just make that available to anybody? And they put it into the public domain so that people can use it and do it. A humongous social step right there. It's from we're keeping it secret to what good is it to us because we have no biology. Let's get it out there. And so now let's look at the trajectory of the field. So prior to this activity from 1950 to 95, you had most of the work going on the steroid ones. Okay? Very little work. But if you look in 2009, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of them became interesting. They're not genetic hits, right? So uh, reverb is one. That's a mutated in uh, mature onset diabetes of the young. So it's not the genetics that did it, something else. Interesting, these are the eight and the only eight where GSK made a nice compound and made it available. And have a look what happened to the research activity of the planet. If you rank nuclear receptors by popular to not, they rank according to, is there a research tool, a compound, a good compound, that I can do an experiment with? It's not related to when the mouse was made or when the gene was cloned or where the genetic linkages are. It's to do the practicalities of, can I do an experiment? And so this gave us the idea, 
really to start the SGC, said, well, if we can make tool compounds to these unknown things in the human genome, the long tail, then we may be able to cause professors who would never work on it before, because professors hate to be told what to do. But the idea is like, you'll throw a chemical probe out there and it flies on you know what, right? Everyone will go, ooh, blah, blah, blah. And we can start to move biomedical research to new areas. So that was the idea that we published. So Tim was at Glaxo at the time, and uh, Chaz is, uh, heads up our lab at Oxford. And the idea is, why don't we consider chemistry, instead of a proprietary thing, like a, a proto-drug, more, it's got more value to society as a research tool to open up and learn about biology. And if we think of it that way, as a, as a public good, as opposed to a proprietary con uh, asset, then you can get more science done quickly. So that was the project we started to, to launch. And of course, making one of these high quality inhibitors is greatly facilitated by having the structure. So it fit in really well with what we were also doing with the structural biology side. And we came up with the concept that why don't we form a partnership where our organization uh, will do cell-based screening, biochemical screening, three-dimensional structures, and really characterize the compounds. And the chemistry would be done in industry where they're really good at it, right? And together, we would commit to make an outstanding inhibitor, and I'll describe what outstanding means in a second, to a new protein, and we'll commit to put that compound in the public domain without restriction, to let everybody play with it and find out what the protein does. Once the more knowledge is in the public domain, anyone, pharma, anybody, can say, you know what? I'm comfortable enough that we should test whether this is a good target by making a clinical candidate, et cetera, okay? So that was the philosophy of what we're trying to do. Remember, the big point is, how do we learn more biology? The system won't do it without some push. The best push is to get a compound or a pull or whatever you want to call it, okay? So that's what we set about to do. But it's really important to define quality because a compound, even a nanomolar inhibitor, will hit probably between 10 and 30 proteins in the human genome just by you know, uh, mass action and, and just binding uh, thermodynamics. So you really need to be careful when you use these things. And so we define a probe, it's a selective drug-like molecule that gets into cells and is proven to bind the protein you want in a cell and do something. Um, so operationally, we came up with this definition, which has become sort of now the industry standard for what defines a chemical probe. It's 100 nanomolar biochemically binding to your protein. It's active at one micromolar in cells, and it's proven that the molecule gets in and hits your protein inside the cell. But that's not good enough because it needs to be selective. And so we measure the activity of this against 15 other, other common uh, off targets, all the GPCRs, all the rest of the kinases, all the other epigenetics proteins, ion channels, SIPs, right? So that when you use this protein in your lab, you have a very good idea. When you see a result, what is going on and what are the, what are the possible confounders in there? We try and make it a negative control compound, a slight structural change that the compound looks almost the same, but it's inactive as a control, and we try to make two orthogonal, two different chemistries to the same target. And that is how you use chemistry to discover what a protein does in, in, a, in biology. The downside is that it costs about two million bucks to make a protein, a, sorry, a compound of this quality. And this is why we're doing it as a, in a large partnership with industry. Industry has given us, so one of the core features about the SGC is we never patent anything ever. And yet industry has given us over the last 15 years, $200 million to do a project explicitly to put stuff in the public domain. Because industry sees the problem is the biology. It's not can I make a compound. It's we don't know what to do, right? And, and you need a lot more than uh, uh, an idea that this is related to that. And pharmacological probes are uh, an outstanding sort of next hint that it might be interesting. So one of the first um, probes we made was this molecule here called JQ1, but the idea wasn't ours. We were just the, the, the medium to get it into the public domain. This was Mitsubishi and GlaxoSmithKline's discovery. And years before this paper, they knew that bromodomains could be inhibited. These are proteins that bind lysine, but only when lysine's acetylated. 
and they're part of large complexes and they bring, it's a protein interaction, it brings complexes together. So when this lysine gets acetylated, it binds the bromodomain and the bromodomain is bound to another protein and you build this big complex. And protein interactions at the time were thought to be really hard to do, but Glaxo and Mitsubishi had shown that that was not true. You could inhibit them. And what GSK was struggling with internally was that they had discovered it as a part of an inflammation project and come to the conclusion internally that it probably wasn't going to be a good inflammation drug. In the old days, that would have been put on a shelf and it would have been a secret and still nobody would have known about it. But what Tim did and ultimately Patrick Valance said, you know, why not? Why not let the academics play with it? And they guided us, as it were, to this molecule. It's called JQ1. It's not JQ4322. That gives you a much hint, how much hint we had. And instead of looking at it inflammation, we looked at it together with Jay Bradner, who's a, a so Panagus is in the lab at uh, SGC in, in uh, Oxford. And Jay is a clinician who treated patients where there was a translocation in which this pro, the putative target was fused to another protein. So the hypothesis was if we make an, a molecule and it hits the fusion protein, the fusion protein activity will go away and the cells will die, and indeed that's what happened. But the cool part was the commitment in advance that we made all, everyone agree to, uh, to put this in the public domain for everybody. And that's what happened. And so the story again begins with you know, Glaxo telling us this is what you should do, and we went, got it. We're choosing the right biology, and this is, of course, working with cells from patients, not you know, cells that have been alive for 30 years in a dish. A commitment to put the data into the public domain, so we published it and we gave the compound to everybody. Uh, GSK published their inflammation story in the same issue. The compound went out and was used by hundreds and hundreds of people. We would literally just ship it. No MTAs here. Good luck. Don't eat it. That was our restriction. Um, and then other people, not us, used the compound to link the target to cancers that had many more patients. This was a really rare cancer. And this got industry interested, and GlaxoSmithKline said, don't, it's not an inflammation drug, this is a cancer drug. And they shifted their program, and they were first in man two years and two months after the compound appeared in the patent literature. Compare that with Gleevec, which took six years from the exact t equals zero to first in man. So first disclosure in the patent literature, first in man. Okay? Now, I phoned Brian Drucker, who is the physician who championed this project, and I said, is this fair? I mean, the internet was here, you know, you guys were using probably faxes or whatever. And he said, it is fair because two years of this six were failed negotiations between the company and the university on who owns the blah, blah, blah. So much so that he had to move from Harvard to Oregon to carry out the experiment, and Oregon signed the exact deal that Harvard would not sign. And so you, there's a very strong case to be made that the commitment to sharing, particularly by GlaxoSmithKline, it was a risk for them, accelerated if this becomes a drug, and it probably won't. If it does, it would have accelerated the, the time that patients get helped by four years. And I think this is a tremendous I think vindication of the idea that open science, even in chemistry, even in stuff where people think, oh, ooh, that's patentable stuff, it's actually in the public good. And there are now 40 clinical trials of this idea. So this, in quotation marks, validated target or a target with more confidence. And so we're often said, well, if you don't patent the molecule, then you'll inhibit drug discovery. Well, that's absolutely not true. Because what happens is as soon as you get confidence in the target, you can make all these companies make different compounds, and each will have different properties, and they're all racing to see. Okay? So I think it's a really cool story about how the idea of chemistry is the tool that we can use as a lever to move things. The partnership with industry gives us access to resources we wouldn't have. The commitment to open on a protein that no one had worked on before, and then the downstream consequences of moving that idea into the clinic. Um, so the Chemical Pro project, we, we have about 200 ongoing projects with pharma now. Uh, nine pharma are in the organization. We've delivered 50 uh, so far, and we sent out more than 12,000 samples of these compounds all around the world, and 3,000 papers have been published uh, that mention uh, the compounds already. And so, you know, one compound, it's expensive to make, 
but it has a tremendous impact. And our greatest accomplishment, I think, is that because we have no material transfer agreements, we don't need any lawyers, and we estimate we've saved 750 lawyer years on the planet. And so does science these compounds again? Remember, the nuclear receptor story was retrospective. Our hypothesis was when you put compounds out there, you will change the way science is done. And so here is the plot of papers on the bromodomain family and on the specific target itself over the years, and that at inflection point, indeed, and was the release of the chemical probes. So the hypothesis was putting probes out there will change, will attract attention, and will let people, the BRAF story is the same one. When there's a molecule out there, people start to use it, and indeed it happens here. And for some of the probes, you know, these in blue are proteins we've made probes for, the year we published it, and in every single case it's the number one or number, the probe description paper is the number one or number two cited paper since t equals zero when we published it. And that's the same for the nuclear receptor probes, it's the same for the kinase probes. They have tremendous academic impact. And so I think of all the things that we could do as an organization, I think it was a good idea to focus on, on making chemistry. But it's a big sticker shot, right? How can a professor in a, a one lab do this? I argue you can't, right? You need to partner with industry. You need to do it in a large organization. And it's $2 million. And that's a lot of money to do all the proper characterization to make sure it's reproducible and stuff. So I think it's important, and, and, and as a story, I'll tell you what happens when poorly characterized probes, when you try and cut corners and you say, well, it's not, we don't want to do all those selectivity assays. It's a pretty good inhibitor. It looks like it's working in cells. So the most common way any of us now would search for a reagent is we put it in Google. Okay, so if you want an AMP kindase inhibitor, you type in that into Google, and now it pops out a whole bunch of hits. And you say, wow. AMP kinase inhibitor, high purity, cool. So you click on that, and you get this dorsomorphin structure. And they overload you with chemical gobbledygook that you think, wow, this has got to be good, right? Potent and selective. It's got all words in there that you want, off targets, nanomolar stuff. And you think, OK, I'm buying this. And also, you look in previous papers, and they've used it before as an AMP kinase inhibitor. So obviously, it was published in cell before, and this one says all this good stuff. It must be an AMP kinase inhibitor. So Pfizer, of course, did a partial screen of the kinome with this inhibitor and found out that uh, the AMP kinase is way down on the list of kinases this compound inhibits. It inhibits uh, GPCRs, kinases, some enzymes far better than AMP, which was 14th out of a, a not a large number. And so if you want to see that this inhibits the kinase and you believe it going into your experiment, you will find out that it works. But linking the phenomenon you just found with this and the target AMPK is a very bad idea and leads to results that cannot be reproduced. And it is really common. If you take some of these compounds, none of which are selective, uh, you know, this Lily compound, it's a non-selective PI kinase inhibitor, but everyone uses it as a selective one. There were 1,000 papers. Every paper on average, if you divide NIH funding by papers funded, it's like 1,500, 1,000, no, so $150,000 to $200,000 per paper. Start doing the math. All these papers are complete artifacts. We just published a paper last month on looking at all the histone acetyltransferase inhibitors that have been reported in the literature. We tested 23, none hit, none was a histone acetyltransferase inhibitor. They all inhibited the assay, they all were artifacts that inhibited the fluorescence in the assay, zero. And all the papers that have been published with any one of these 23, Avi just published a beautiful inhibitor that is one, but it's only one and that got just published. So the entire literature that uses compounds to validate, in quotation marks, histone acetyltransferases are bunk, okay? And there's long lists. And so, it, you know, making chemical probes that cost $2 million, I showed you they have impact on academia, but if you don't spend it, the impact on academia is even worse. And industry will tell you that many, many compounds, indeed most compounds, are used by us inappropriately. So how to fix this? I mean, publish that they are bad probes? That's been done. Those compounds I showed you before, 
there's papers out there that say these are bad, and yet 300 papers were in 2014. There's a the beautiful paper in 2009 saying that all these are junk, but it doesn't stop people using them. So that doesn't work. More qualified reviewers of manuscripts? Absolutely, if we could have that, that would be helpful. But you know, it's a biology paper, and there's one figure with a compound, and it says it's an inhibitor of fill in the blank protein, and it was published before in a big journal. Who's the reviewer going to say no? But I think that this needs to be done. And similarly, when we're handing out funding, right, we need to have some experienced people who, when chemical biology is being discussed and compounds are being used by biologists um, to, to make sure that this doesn't happen. Our little attempt is we've created this organization called chemicalprobes.org in which um, we have a select few of about 300 uh, people from industry and academia and when a probe is nominated as a selective one, they look at all the data and they have like a one star, two star, three stars, and then they also have a little statement on don't use it or this is good or watch out, don't use it in mice, but it works in cell culture or something like that. There's no real answer on how to do this yet, uh, so it's a work in progress, but the problem is enormous. There are literally billions of dollars being wasted because we can't sort this out. And it's no one's fault, right? I mean, I'm a biochemist, or we're not going to know all this medicinal chemistry stuff. Um, so we have to trust somebody else. But I'm saying we're trusting the wrong people now. And so, um, what I what I've told you is that the our organization, I mean, uses structural biology. You know, we've the organizations contribute about 13 percent of all the knowledge of human protein structures, and we take that <laughs> structural biology with industry and with academics and make selective inhibitors. And we have an effort that tests them in human cells in collaboration with hospitals now. And so we're going to continue to do that because we think that that's the best way that we can help uh, raise the level of biological understanding, certainly in the long tail. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I did you know, eight years of ge genetics in yeast. It, Genetics is a great experiment because it's unbiased, but it doesn't have any impact on biochemists or doctors. And until we figure out how to, you know, prioritize other folks to work on genetically cool proteins or genes, as it were, um, it's, we're going to continue to exacerbate this power law curve that I showed you before. So chemistry is one way to do it. I, th I still think we need to think a lot harder how to do it. So I want to talk about now the real problem, which is target validation occurs in people, okay? And so to put something in people, you need it to be safe, effective, et cetera, which we don't believe should be done in academia. We'd, I don't know why, but we don't believe so. We think that's a commercial-driven thing. And as a result, it's not shared, and it's kept secret, and we don't learn anything. And so clearly no one would arrive on the planet and say, this is how we should invent drugs. We should give it to a company, let them keep it secret, and when they, it fails, they try and hide why it fails, right? Society doesn't learn anything. Drug discoveries, productivity is going down. Um, it's, it's not a good system. And so the problem is, with what we've done, I showed you this curve before, right? With uh, attrition at all the steps. But for most targets, once they get excited and look at the Bromo domain story, which we contributed to, many companies are doing the same thing, none of whom are sharing their data. There's some laws now that say you have to share your clinical trial data when you're done, so that's 10 years later we'll finally learn what happened here. It's not good enough. We need to make this faster. And so this is a tragic waste of money. It's a, it's a tragic waste of intellect, right? Because if it's one of the 95 out of 100 that's not going to work, everybody who works on this is wasting their time. And it also is a, if you think about it, it's actually not in the public good and not for patients. Because for, if you're in oncology, for example, when you go on a new drug, you, you usually have failed all the existing treatments. So in the absence of this, you're going to die. And so now you're taking dying people and convincing them to go on the trial because if it works, if it doesn't work, at least we'll learn something. Well, if the first company learns it doesn't work, they don't tell the rest of them. And so after two haven't worked, now we know the idea is bad. Every patient, if it's breast cancer, every woman who's getting this drug is getting poisoned in the last two months of her life. It's idiotic. 
right? But it's the system, it's nobody's fault. We all endorse it tacitly in the way we act every day and the way we invest our money, our pension funds and stuff. And, but it's not right. So how can we think about you know, taking what really began in the, in the genesis of the Genome Project and thinking of science as a public good? I don't see why medicine shouldn't be a public good also. We've let it evolve with this corporate stuff, um, but you know, we think it's far more efficient use of funds. You saw that graph, that's not true, right? It's not like there's not enough money in the world. We spend a lot of money. We spend it in balkanized ways so we can do that better. So why not think about taking this concept of open science and actually starting to make medicines in the open and make them affordable. And so why not? I mean, the evidence shows that target validation occurs only in proof of concept studies in man. The stuff that we do is not target validation. Then you can make a cogent argument that everything before proof of concept is discovery science. It's experimental medicine. It's a hypothesis. Why shouldn't that be in the public domain? Because hypotheses are best answered transparently. The pharmaceutical sector, you know, when you talk to a business person, uh, you know, governments and public can't spend money well, well, they're not doing such a good job. So I don't see why a competitive, you know, organization in the public domain is such a bad idea. Um, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but it'll apply some pressure to them. I mean, think of it, the public pays for the research and we pay for the product at the end of the day, don't we, as well, right, through our NHS or through the Canadian healthcare system. Even America, most of their spending is in the public domain with the VA and Medicare and Medicaid. So the public sector is paying for everything except for the bit in the middle where they get to jack the prices up. And so I think if you could have lower prices, a return on investment to society would absolutely be there. And so, again, this is ludicrous where we consider medicines, and it, we've slept walked into this, right, as a commercial product. Sure, they need to be manufactured and distributed and sold like refrigerators and stuff, right? But why, you know, shouldn't it be a human right? I mean, we do spend public money on this. And so I think if you think about it, there's no reason not to think about it this way. The only reason we don't think about it this way is because the systems in place have convinced us that the other way is right. But there's no logical reason why it has to be like that. And so to test out the hypothesis that we can do something in the public, we created a company, M4K Pharma, which is wholly owned by a trust we set up. So none of us get any money, none of us get any equity. Everything, if it works, everything goes into this, this trust. Um, and it's virtual, you don't have to have people. And we're gonna share all the science. We're not gonna patent anything. And so for professors to get involved in helping this drug discovery program, which I'll describe in the future, in the next few slides, um, basically it's like a grant. You get, you get to do some science, you get to publish it, you get to be involved in cutting edge stuff, and the science gets to be used to advance a drug, okay? And we're gonna focus on rare childhood cancers for now. Ultimately, we're gonna do it for everything. But for rare child, really rare childhood cancers, the business model, there's not even a way that the business model could work if you were a pharma. The patient population is too small, it's pediatric, so you're frightened. So currently, the modus operandi for small, rare brain cancers, for example, of children, is we let them die. And so obviously something's gotta be done and, and the current system doesn't work. And so we'll share all the results with the community, we'll not patent anything, but there's this little law, and I can talk about it later, but I, I won't, but you can ask me about the regulatory data that accompany a molecule. So when you go to a, the FDA or the EMA and you say, I would like to put this drug into a person, they say, prove it, prove it's safe, prove it's, you know, uh, it gets into that, prove it's on target. And so you provide them with a large data package, which is a formal document and say, here's the proof. And as you do the clinical trials, that becomes part of the, uh, data that will convince them to approve your drug to go on the market. Those data are also intellectual property that belong to you. Okay, so you don't need a patent and you can, and this data remains secret for five years, eight years, ten years, depending on where you are. Enough time to protect your market. So with this form of intellectual property, it allows me to share the science, but still maintain exclusive rights to sell. And if I don't take any venture capital, I can sell it for whatever price I want, which is affordable. And so uh, we recruited someone to head it up. He's a businessman, and he thinks that this business model of being able to share the science up front so everybody contributes, so you can get a lot of resource, but 
from everybody um, and to take this molecule forward. The, the, the thing we're focusing on is uh, a, a rare uh, cancer of the brain stem called pontine glioma. It's inoperable because of where it is in the brain. So when the children get it, uh, they all die, and they all die between 9 and 12 months. Radiation therapy increases life, it's, they shrink the tumor, but then it grows back and then, and then they die. But it's a very small case. Now what's interesting in quotation, interesting in, in quotation marks about children's brain tumors, they're not like cancers of adults where accumulated mutations overload the system and then it becomes a, a tumor. They're actually more like diseases of development where very specific mutations cause the cell division to go awry or to de-differentiate. And in this particular case, the genetics shows that there are a founder mutation in one of the histones and then a bunch of other mutations that can contribute to the cancer, one of which is in this gene ACVR1, which is a kinase, and it's an activating mutation of the kinase, akin to BRAF in melanoma. This mutation turns the kinase on. And so a compound theory should be able to turn it off. We can do that, but whether it has an effect in people, we don't know. So we decided in this company, in this sort of peace and love company, to make an inhibitor of this kinase and to take it all the way through clinical trials, and if it works, market the drug and, and make it marketed at you know, some small price above what it really costs, which should be in the, in the dollars, not in the thousands. Okay, so far we've got two, for the chemists out there, we've got two potent selective series. We think we can have 18 to 24 months before we're ready to take it into people. Um, we're optimizing them now. We've just got a $2 million grant from the Ontario government to do this. We have a corporate uh, sponsor who's donating us about a million and a half dollars. So we have enough resource of chemistry resource to get this thing to uh, IND, we think. And in the spirit of openness, that's our lead. Uh, when you do drug discovery projects, you, you say, what would a drug look like? What is the target product profile? And so you have to know where you're going as you're doing all your chemistry. You know, you need, I need something that gets into the brain. It doesn't hit this protein. It's got a cellular concentration of this, of plasma bind. And so these are all the TPP criteria that we have. We're getting there. It already works in, in animal models. It extends the life of, of the animals that where you put the tumor in their brain. And so we're having our first kickoff meeting next week where any chemist can phone in um, around the world. We're going to go through our chemistry plans. It's going to be drug discovery in the open, as it were, so people can, can watch what we're doing and hopefully contribute, contribute ideas. And if this works, I think it'll be a really interesting, really interesting switch in what is science and what is um, what we think should be commercial. We're taking a drug target that no one's ever made a drug to before. We're going to commit to make a safe, effective molecule to take into people. We're going to share the science all the way, get people to contribute ideas en route. If it works, uh, we're going to license the data to allow a manufacturer to make the pill and sell it at, let's say, 15% profit and cut it at that. And I don't see why this model doesn't work for many other diseases, but we're going to start, we're going to start with this one. Because I think it's, 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 all, it's better science because it'll be transparent. It gets the knowledge out there quicker. Um, and hopefully we can uh, make it cheaper. And so I'm often asked, you know, how can we help? Um, so just chat to folks. I mean, patents drive information, drive innovation is a government policy. There is absolutely no evidence for that, right? But it's sort of, we're taught at birth that that's what, how it works. And so there's, if you read the literature, there's, like the front page of The Economist two years ago was patents are an anachronism, right? They don't, they don't do what they're supposed to do. They're now offensive and defensive chits in, war, in a corporate warfare as opposed to protecting ideas. Tell the people about the idea, at least that somebody is trying to make a public good uh, drug company or a drug organization, shall I say. Um, are there other ideas? You guys are the geneticists. You must be coming up with cool potential mutations that are strongly linked to the disease and happen to be in a protein that might be druggable, those are perfect candidates for this organizational structure. Uh, and that's the website. So I'm hoping, so that was the last slide. So I, you can see the transition that we've been making since the early 2000s when we did protein structures and put them in the public domain. At the time, everyone thought they should be patented. 
And then in 2008, we started to put chemistry in the public domain. Then and even now, people think, well, that's heretical. You should patent that kind of stuff. And we're starting to think in this first idea about how do we do a public good company to make medicines with the idea that proof of concept in man is where research stops, right? And so this is, we're going to test the hypothesis that inhibiting ALK2 in a human actually makes a tumor shrink. We'll never know that until phase two clinical trials. And so we're going to treat that as, a, as an open target validation exercise. Thank you. So, the, um, so these aren't our patents. These are our uh, patents that come from Harvard, I think, and they're two academic patents. And so when we make our molecule, when we start to do chemistry off those, we'll go into areas of patent space that are uncharted. So we have a, in the background to this, of course, you, you need to stay away from other people's patents. And these are great examples of how patenting hurts, right? Because that, patent out there was a public, was a paper, academic paper that they decided just to pee on the turf. And so all, now we got to go through the effort of getting around it, which is simple, but it just takes six months. And so um, we have what they call freedom to operate searches going on now. We're going to get out of the patent space. And, and by putting the rest of our, I have a slide that I didn't show you. Our chemistry plans have been published already. So we're preempting. Uh, we're not going to ask because uh, you enter into that conversation and then somebody in the tech transfer office is going to get uppity and then we'll be in nine months of chatting. It's much easier to just ignore it and go somewhere else. They're not pursuing this, uh, this disease, so the chemistry that we end up doing is going to be different if whatever they do. So you have a, quite a strong thesis that genetics doesn't move the dial for research. I think that's quite interesting from a place which is kind of uh, full of genetics. And there could be an argument here that this is more about, um, you know, is this a, as much about bringing the, so, so it's taking, this, taking away the, the kind of human aspect of the way research is funded. Do you believe that this, uh, the genetics is a natural perturbation hypothesis? works? Do you buy the enrichment absolutely. that uh, GSK and other people have seen? I, I absolutely agree with the thesis that genetics is the perfect unbiased experiment that should be the foundation of our experiments. Unfortunately, the world doesn't think that, or it's too risky for people to change what they do to incorporate this as by, like imagine if you tell me that this gene is important, I got to make a cell line, I got to, it's faster now, but I got to make a good antibody. I got to recruit a student. I got to stop what I'm doing. My grant just finished and I lost my tenure, right? And so you have these sort of sociological impediments to really putting some oomph behind pursuing, you know, who's going to make the protein if it's a hard protein? How are you going to develop a functional assay for it? There's skill sets that aren't in the geneticist's hands or in other people's hands, but for other people to work in it, they got to stop what they're doing so they don't like it. If the genetic link is tenuous, then it's a risk. You're not working on something that's hot. It's, it's, it's distressing, really, because what you're saying is exactly right. We should all be working on genetic targets, right? But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, certainly in this little patch of the world, I think there's a stronger group of people, you know, hauling the experiments closer to the genetics. But it's, this is a pub conversation I can see coming our way. Okay. Hi, Al. Um, my lab uses the chemical probes portal, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, are there, are, do you know of plans to more systematically characterize tools and probes and drugs like the chemical probes portal does, and also more quantitatively, so for example, you know, profiling against kinases and GPCRs and so forth? Do you think that would be valuable, and do you know of efforts to do something more systematic and comprehensive beyond what is a relatively limited set of molecules at the moment? That's right. Uh, and so, um, around. The answer is no, but we want to do it. And we only want to do it because I think we can. You can imagine it's a very expensive experiment. To profile any compound against the 1500 would cost you $100,000. And no one with an NIH grant or with a Wellcome Trust grant could justify that. And so it needs to be done a, a, as a group. 
the pharmaceutical companies in our consortium are going to start donating molecules and all the underlying data to the SGC for us to channel into the public domain. And these are programs that they've killed internally. The probes that will be the academic vetters of the quality of their probes, so it's not like they can give us anything. It'll meet all our criteria, and then it'll go. But again, those are only 70. Um, so I, I think I, I'm agreeing with you. There needs to be something systematic just to raise the game of, of all of us, because these are great molecules to test biology if they're good, right? And you can find all sorts of cool stuff. Hi, Ali, uh, Ricardo Macaron from GSK. Thank you for a very progressive uh, talk. And uh, I mean, we can argue for, for uh, a long time about some of the concepts here, but um, I applaud really as a scientist working in uh, drug discovery what you are doing here. But one point you made I really want to argue against is the idea that uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, are not sharing failure and we are not learning. I mean, I agree with that, with, which uh, I absolutely disagree with the idea that academicians are doing better. So clinical trials, pharmaceutical companies, only recently, but the last uh, five years, there's been a, a long uh, and a steady effort to uh, publish everything. Uh, you go to public databases and you can find results from <coughs> clinical trials run from, from companies. The ones run from, from academic groups actually are absolutely lagging behind. So there is a fundamental problem. It's, uh, you know, we like publishing positive results. We don't like publishing negative results and 90% of clinical trials fail. And again, you know, something else has to change, not just saying pharma is bad, academics uh, I, I didn't good, say so. pharma is bad, <laughs> obviously, because, you know, there are our colleagues. But the structure, of the, or the structure of the process is bad. And, and so the, what you were speaking about is that in one of the, I think it was in the New England Journal or Lancet, they looked at the disclosure of clinical trial data post facto, to be fair, post facto. And pharmaceutical companies are far more willing to share. Now, currently they share redacted versions. Okay, so the EMA makes one share a failed trial, but you're allowed to go into those documents and cross out everything commercially sensitive. So we're a long way from open, and in both the academic and industry-driven trials, they're not done in real time. And so, you know, we move in fast science where every month we can change our ideas, but when we learn about how molecules behaved in people, it's six years after our ideas. And so somehow I'm arguing that that six years of silence should be eliminated uh, if we're going to really start to validate more targets than we're validating. Though I think many trialists would say it's quite important to have that rigor of not opening the box. Oh, the blinded, sure. Yeah, sure. So you can't, you can't kind of open the box until the end. As until it were. the end of the, of yeah. the stages, right, yeah. of the phase one and the phase two. But absolutely. Sally? So, yeah, I guess a, a, another voice for industry. One of the challenges you have, uh, even when you are making some degree of data transparent, is there's no general agreement on what real proof of mechanism looks like. So another company study fails and maybe it didn't have the potency, it didn't have the bio bioavailability, they weren't using the right biomarkers, et cetera, so on. And I mean, I think things like the log 2 consortium where they're all sitting down together and saying, what is a biomarker for log 2 I think we are starting to make a better job around that and particularly for genetically validated targets, there's much more willingness to sit around the table and agree ahead of time what does a good proof of mechanism study look like so that when you do see a lack of efficacy, you're convinced you tested the yeah, mechanism. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. But, but you also know, and for those who sit in some of these meetings, um, the Merck compound fails and you're at AbbVie. And it failed and you look at their data and your data looks so good and you spent three years on it. So you're gonna try and find out why their biomarker sucks and yours is good, right? And because you can't say that I wasted three years of my life. And this is what happens if it's not transparent, and often you hear not complete how they did the experiment and you don't get the actual lab notebooks. And so the argument that doing the first novel target, novel mechanism, the first one should be open. So people can transparently disagree and have evidence-based arguments over whether the biomarker was the correct one or whether they used the wrong you know, formulation or et cetera. I think that that is really the, the end game of where we should be, that if it's a novel target, novel mechanism, first time in man should be open. Then compete to make a best medicine. 
not compete on darts is it the target I would just make a plea for uh, the pro portal to think about systematically collecting mouse PK data with all of the probes so that um, academics who maybe don't have access to those kinds of um, disciplines um, to actually measure drug levels in rodent models would have a comprehensive data set to look at when they're trying to select dosing for their animal models because it's not just about um, having the right compound, it's about dosing it and being able to measure exposure and target engagement. And a lot of times, preclinical work going on in academic labs is going on in um, a vacuum, you know. Again, somebody publishes this dose in this animal model showed an effect. And there's both a, an educational piece and an access to data that is really required in order to make those um, preclinical disease model studies meaningful. Uh, absolutely, and, and the pharma probes that I spoke about before, the donated ones, it will have all that PK. The probes that we've made, we explicitly, our target product profile doesn't include pharmacology. We stop at cell-based, simply because we have a finite amount of resource. We're trying to make the most tools to the most proteins, and if you decide to make it good in a mouse, then you've got a lot more chemistry to do, and you have to do fewer. Uh, but it's good, but you see people using molecules that don't even get into the brain for CNS studies. Um, yeah, it, it, you're exactly right.